Hello and welcome. Um, today's webinar is entitled Delivering Data Driven Controls in a Dynamic World. We have two great presenters today to share some of their latest thinking. Just a few reminders as we start the presentation. We are recording today's webinar, so it will be available for you on demand following uh, today's event. If you do experience any lags in the webinar, please refresh the page. We recommend you using Google, Google Chrome as your internet browser and Ultimately, uh, you can adjust the webinar audio by using the media player at the bottom of your screen. If you're experiencing any other technical difficulties during the webinar, please submit your comments or questions um, and we'll answer them through the Q&A. We'll be monitoring them and we'll be hoping to troubleshoot if you have any problems. We'd like to make today's session as interactive as possible, so I do encourage you to submit your content questions throughout the session as well. We will address as many questions as possible during the dedicated Q&A event at the end of the webinar. And naturally, we'd appreciate you letting us know any other burning issues or topics you would like to hear about either today or in our future sessions. We're going to do some polling during, during today, today's event as well. Um, so um, please use that as a temperature check with you and your peers um, when it comes to implementing data-driven controls. We've got two speakers today. Um, we will uh, introduce them shortly. Um, Stan Oparonov uh, is our NACA Chartered Accountant and the Prativity UK Process Mining Lead driving the use of enabling technologies and focusing on equipping clients in their three lines of defense. Andrew is a managing director in our US practice, leading Prativity's global IT audit practice. So let's start by looking at a, a poll and getting a sense of the temperature today. Hopefully you can see in front of you today's question. How familiar are you with the data analytics discipline of process mining? I'll give you a few minutes, uh, I'll give you a few seconds, sorry, now to, uh, to complete that, and then we'll shortly show you the results. Okay, uh, hopefully you can see that the uh, page is refreshed. Uh, I'm now going to uh, hand over to Andrew to say a, a few words on, on this um, this piece and then take forward the, the rest of the presentation. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Gary, um, and good day, everyone. Good to be with you. I hope uh, just given all that's going on in the world, everyone um, is joining us in a good state of physical and mental well-being. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. We, we ran a version of this webinar several weeks ago for a largely U.S. audience, and the results of this polling question were, were somewhat different, in particular the extent to which organizations or attendees were commenting that they were actively using process mining. So I, I think perhaps not surprising given where process mining, and we'll cover this in a little more detail, kind of got, got its start and initiated, which was you know, largely in uh, Netherlands and Germany, it's still very prominent in, in those parts of of Europe, um, but sort of moving their way westward and starting to get broader appreciation and adoption in, in other parts of the world. But I think um, for, for those of you that have no familiarity or have maybe heard of it um, but not seen it in action, which is the majority, we'll, we'll be able to resolve for that today during the discussion. Um, and for those of you that have a bit more hands-on experience, perhaps we can provide a few additional insights and, and give you some additional sort of thoughts and ideas around how it might be applied to other parts of your organization. So just just to cover quickly the, the areas we'll address today, we're going to talk about process mining. Um, we're going to talk about it in the context of controls um, and in that context describe how as a as a sort of a discipline of, of data analytics, 
and business intelligence. It can help you identify not just what went wrong, so that what is sort of, you know, um, what deviation did I see and, and, and how many times did I see it, but, you know, to what extent, start to, start to drive some of that quantification, which is often very important, uh, and, and equally get beyond that and start to look at the why, which is the root cause, uh, and that's where many times traditional approaches sort of start to fall short. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the value of delivering data-driven improvements to the control assessment process, in particular uh, the benefits of, of using data to, to help inform our view on controls performance and control performance over time. Um, we'll comment and show on how analytic tests can not just be used to evaluate controls compliance, but also help drive efficiency improvements. And then, and then hopefully we will leave you all with a, an in, increased appreciation for what's really possible when it comes to the use of analytics and continuous monitoring, continuous auditing, continuous controls assessment. So as we kind of get into the, the main body of today's session, I wanted to just take a couple of minutes and um, ground everyone on a, a framework, sort of a vision or a point of view that Prativity has established around next generation internal audit. I think this could equally be applied to next generation other stuff too, uh, but it's presented here in the context of next generation internal audit, and there are you know, three main components around governance methodology and enabling technology, and under each of those three, there are four capabilities, so a total of 12. And, and really, this kind of framework represents uh, our point of view on the types of capabilities, opportunities, endeavors that we've seen organizations pursuing in their attempt to do what they do, but do it better. And better can obviously be um, defined differently depending on what your objectives are. But oftentimes we see audit functions trying to do things more efficiently and effectively, a fairly obvious objective. Uh, increase their coverage, increase their kind of, let's call it risk flexibility. So uh, following the right risks to the point where they have sufficient assurance. Uh, being able to improve and increase the stakeholder experience, their interactions with stakeholders throughout the audit or the controls evaluation life cycle. And then, and then trying to be more um, digitally capable, digitally enabled, data driven, perhaps innovative, one way to describe that, in in their approaches, in their tooling, in their methods. Um, it's not intended to be a checklist approach, so you don't start in the top right and check your way around the circle or the, the horseshoe. Um, it's not even really intended to be exhaustive or prescriptive. There are certainly other capabilities that we've seen organizations and, and clients of ours pursue that they've been able to pursue to great effect in improving the areas of focus and the activities and operations of the order and controls and functions. But it's intended to provide those sort of things to think about, uh, maybe be a little provocative, maybe give you some thoughts around what we could pursue, what we could do um, to maybe help us execute our order and our controls responsibilities better tomorrow than we have been today and prior. Uh, and we're going to focus a bit on the top left uh, section or component today, in particular around process mining and our view of how that supports the overall vision and journey towards um, that state of next gen or that sort of function of the future or that you know, internal audit or controls 2 or 3.0, whichever numbering system you're kind of currently working towards. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch briefly on uh, Salonis. We're going to talk about process mining generally. We are going to uh, do a, a, a demo or a walkthrough of the Salonis, uh, the Salonis process mining tool with a focus on uh, some content that Prativity has developed. Um, but process mining is you know, a discipline now that's been around for probably a dozen or more years. Um, that has really come, at least in, in, my, in my opinion, to prominence in the last handful of years. 
probably along the same timeline that we've seen some of the other uh, emerging technologies rise to prominent things like RPA um, and probably slightly behind what we saw with some of the visualization analytics technologies. But really what, what it's about at its core, and we'll show you this in more detail, is about taking transactional information yeah. and allow you to the transactional information in the process mining context means uh, what was done, what was it done to, when did it happen, and ideally who did it. Those are the, those are the components of, of transactional information or data points. Taking that information and allowing you to recreate visually uh, and through other means the way in which your transactions are actually being processed in your systems. And for those of you that responded, you've heard about it, or you, 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 this is the first time you're hearing about it, we'll show you what that actually looks like and what that means and how it can be applied. But it allows you to do that process discovery in a very data-driven way, looking at the entire population. Um, it allows you to take that discovery effort and through other features in the platform, turn that discovery into action uh, and into intervention and into a, into a process improvement phase. And then it allows you, and, and this is absolutely kind of the one of the main reasons we uh, built some of the custom controls-based um, content. It absolutely allows you to then go into the, the sort of the monitoring phase of the life cycle. So discovery, uh, a core activity that internal audit and controls focus folks will, will go through. I'm trying to understand the process, do walkthroughs, do narratives, do process flows before we get into field work. Um, the enhancement is, is, is part of what we do as, as providing recommendations, stopping short generally of sort of the hands-on remediation and improvement itself. Uh, that's where the business takes over typically. But then doing some of that monitoring or continuous auditing or um, finding follow-up or, you know, however you might define it. Again, another, you know, Key component of the internal life cycle. So, so with that, I will transition to Stan, and Stan's going to sort of take us into some process mining and slowness specifics. Stan, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, like Andrew, I would like um, to say thank you very much for being here today. Hope everyone is well. Um, we, we have a very exciting demo coming up, um, but just before that, uh, I wanted to highlight some of the key functionality and what we actually use process mining for in, in uh, our next-gen um, vision. So um, rather romantically, we, we, we've sat here, imagine if you could. Um, and while we say imagine if, uh, I want to stress that what um, we're talking about here is very much possible at the moment and uh, we're actively using. And um, that's why um, yeah, we're very excited about the technology because it's no longer t theoretical. Um, so um, imagine if uh, you could use your data to reveal how processes are actually working. And because you're able to see those processes in all of their variants, you can automatically um, set up the tool to inform you and identify instances of control failure or new control deviations. Um, but you won't only be notified about one instance, uh, but you can um, quantify exactly how many to what value with all the uh, additional data that you've um, brought into the tool associated with those transactions. Um, of course, um, process mining can uh, be used not only to monitor controls um, or process deviations, but um, you can focus on efficiencies um, that uh, and that would allow you to do things um, right um, the first time because um, the technology allows you to see where you've got bottlenecks, um, where you've got um, too many manual transactions, where you've got um, too many uh, vendors to provide the same material, for example. So um, going into a bit more detail, um, how do we integrate the technology into um, into our audit process and controls process. So um, we, um, in our next-gen vision, we always say that data analytics and data analysis underpin all of our activities. But um, using process mining, um, we can understand those um, process variations, um, variations from our ideal process, variations from our well-controlled process, or, or variations from our efficient process. 
And because we've got that full visibility, um, we can avoid anecdotal evidence or uh, numerous walkthroughs and straight away um, have a full picture of what's going on in our organization. Thanks to that, as the next step, we can identify the high-risk areas or depending on what our objectives are, that might be um, inefficient areas, um, and then um, focus our efforts and time um, purely on, on those areas. Um, once we've done that, we can um, plug in the data um, as a live source to the tool and perform genuine continuous monitoring, um, not only for new variants, but for um, new uncontrolled instances or new inefficient um, ways of working. Um, so this um, hopefully gives you an idea of how many different um, powerful insights you can gain um, by having a data-driven approach to, to our um, controls monitoring or audit work. Um, and um, be because of that, um, the tool um, can truly be applied across the three lines of defense. And in our live demo, um, shortly, you will be able to see um, how we uh, envision that happening. But just before that, um, we do have another poll question, um, which uh, I'll let Gary um, read out, um, and uh, we can then comment on uh, the results. Okay, everybody. Um, how are you using your data to support activities? I'll give you a few moments to, to have a look at this. Just one, uh, one selection allowed in this one. Okay, as that's refreshing, I'll just start showing the uh, the live screen now. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, over over to you again. Thanks. Yeah, Gary, I'll maybe just quickly comment here on um, the results again, and I think this is pretty representative of what we see much more broadly, which is uh, ad hoc use, perhaps ad hoc at best. Point, point solutions, um, analytics being kind of used you know, here and there, but not on an embedded or sustained basis, um, and you know, certainly not what would be kind of classified as supporting a data-driven approach. So um, I think as, I'll just make another quick comment. I think as we go through the next section, our intention is not really to show you necessarily a kind of a quote-unquote product demo um, it's to demonstrate in some ways kind of what is possible with respect to analytics with, I guess, the right mindset, uh, with the application of the right skill set, um, by having access to a good, a good data set, and then by taking advantage of emerging tools. So the, the combination of those things that really I think are, we, we believe are kind of key in helping organizations advance their analytics and their data use maturity uh, versus uh, us, us sort of showing you a product that is, is the solution. I mean, we, we obviously think it's, um, it's got some benefits, but there's lots of other ways that you can, um, next time you're asked this question, kind of move yourself down, I guess, the visual onto sort of more fully embedded uh, use of data and analytics. So. With that, Stan, I'll, um, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, reimagining audit and controls um, with that data analytics lens, and um, I very much agree with Andrew. This is um, what's possible with the technology available today rather than a prescriptive um, uh, methodology. Um, but what we've tried to, to show you here is um, the power of process mining um, across the audit life cycle. Um, thanks to um, the data-driven approach, you can perform um, a risk assessment and, and then analyze activities and identify outliers, areas of focus, straight away from the start, from the planning phase of the audit, because using process mining, you've got already full visibility of what is actually happening 
in the process you're about to review. And based on that um, risk assessment, you can focus your, your effort and your um, RCM that um, you're going to be using um, on the areas of, of particular interest. Now, with the application um, that we've created on top of uh, the process mining tool, um, we can um, automatically generate tests um, associated with that risk and control matrix. Um, and using some of the workflow functionality in the tool, we can um, raise observations, communicate with the business, and validate those observations, which is essentially the design and operating effectiveness um, phase of our audit combined into one. And um, most importantly, it's, um, it's over the 100% of the transactions. Um, so once again, um, just reminding that we are providing assurance over 100% of our populations, or um, if there are no findings, we can be providing um, probably for the first time or, or very rarely uh, previously, we can provide positive assurance over certain controls. So um, once we've um, performed that phase, validated with the business uh, and reported using the very interactive and user-friendly reporting of the tool, um, we can then um, leave the tool to perform continuous monitoring um, on, on these tests and controls and essentially inform us each time um, we need to um, investigate a particular deviation that was flagged by, by the tool. So, um, I suggest that um, uh, we now move into a live demo so we get an idea of um, what the tool looks like. I will uh, start with a brief overview of how the technology works. So for those of you who are familiar, hopefully that will be a, a welcome refresh. Um, and for, for those of you who, who said that they haven't seen demos of the tool before, um, the, um, hopefully this will give you a, a good idea um, of, of the power of the tool. So um, what I've got in front of me here is a, um, a process flow for the purchase to pay um, process of a sample company. This is a real data set which we've um, sanitized, but um, it is very much a, a real company that we're looking at. Um, what we've done is um, taken the data uh, for a, a for a whole year for the purchase to pay process. And that data consists of more than 1 million purchase order transactions for a total of $2 billion. Now, with the Salonis scripts um, that pick up the data and analyze and map it for us, we can essentially um, create the flow charts for the purchase to pay process for 1 million transactions exactly um, using a, that data-driven approach. And what you can see here is a very standard, uh, nice and lean-looking purchase pro, uh, purchasing process with purchase requisitions, purchase orders, approvals, um, goods receiving, scanning of invoices, and booking them on our system. However, what you can see here is uh, representing only one of possible 525 variants of that purchase to pay process. And you can see that at the bottom right of the screen. Um, now, those 525 variants mean that a purchase order uh, item can go through um, the system from start to finish in 525 different ways. Now, certainly, um, there, are, there is no control environment that can control all of those possible variants. And um, some of them will be very inefficient while others will be circumventing controls inevitably. So I will now expand to the second most common variant where you can see how now the process starts deviating. And you can see how 22,000 cases circumvent the purchase requisition step and continue to the creation of a purchase order. Um, the third most common variant includes 20,000 cases with a price change where um, this is an example of, of a potentially inefficient step. Now, of course, a price change is a very common activity in, in all businesses. However, you can now quantify that, in fact, this happens exactly 21,000 times. Now, you can then 
uh, provide this insight to the business or perhaps even question it, um, because 21,000 price changes could potentially mean um, 10,000 hours of, of people's time changing prices if each one takes half an hour overall. Um, hopefully you get the idea how having all the data in the tool um, can represent the entire process and then you can um, quickly have a full map of the process um, in front of you. Now the reality is this is the purchasing process in this company and these are all 525 possible variants. You can see how quickly it becomes incredibly complex um, and this allows you to, to zoom in um, on specific um, variants. Now, this is the, the, the process map that is created um, by the post mining technology. But of course, all the data associated with those transactions is also um, imported into the tool. So while we have a process map on the left hand side, we can now start explore, exploring some of the additional data, such as the period when the transaction was posted, the vendors associated with um, those transactions. We can um, easily switch between purchasing uh, organizations or material groups if this is the focus of our audit. We can see interesting spikes. Um, and because we've got all of this powerful data, we can also perform activities such as a segregation of duties um, analysis. So what you've got here is all the transactional line items, um, and you can easily check for the create purchase order item activity and the approved purchase order item activity, are there any cases where the same user performed transaction? And you can see that indeed there are 14,000 um, cases where this occurred, and the total value of these transactions was, was $25 million. Now, the first transaction that I see here is um, for a very high value, so $8 million. And just by selecting it, I can filter on that and see that this relates to the vendor CV Barcelona. Now, hopefully this gives you an idea of how powerful the tool is, but because it has all the data in one place and because um, you've got the link between process um, and process flowchart and all the associated data. But what we at Protivity thought we, we had to do is somehow link all this um, data insight back to what um, ultimately is our objective as, as um, second and third line functions, and that is to, to mitigate risk. So we then developed the Protivity Controls Assurance app, which um, hopefully um, looks a little bit more familiar to the audience here. And um, because what we've got is a risk control and analytical test framework. Now, this application sits on top of the process mining tool that um, uh, we just showed you. So you still have the power of the process map um, and all of the data being in one place. But you can now very clearly link the risk of unauthorized purchases, for example, to the control of purchase order approval and a number of associated tests which support that control. For example, um, a purchase order not being approved. We can um, see here that our population that was tested um, and the test passed um, is in one simple image. And this, um, just want to remind you, is again on 100% of, of the transactions. Um, the population might not always be 100% because, for example, in the case of the purchase order not approved um, here, uh, we might have purchase orders which were very recently created and therefore they haven't reached yet a further step um, in, in the process. Therefore, being at the approval step has not occurred and uh, uh, the population is tested is only 95%. However, we can see that 58% um, only um, of, of that uh, population passed the test. So I'll, I'm naturally interested um, what has occurred. Um, we tried to design this as a user-friendly tool to be used by both our clients, but also by, by us, by our own uh, internal auditors. So you can simply click on the test, 
which then takes you to a much more detailed view of, um, of that specific test. Hopefully it has the, the familiar feeling of a working paper. So on the left-hand side, we can see the test, um, its description, the controls and the risks it's associated with. Um, and even if you want to challenge the logic of the test and how it was technically designed, you can select the button um, to show you the technical language that um, underpins that test. Now, um, well, mo most importantly, what you've got at the top is 42% uh, of these transactions failed um, the test. So what I would like to do is just filter by clicking um, on the filter on all failed cases, applying that filter, and now all of these um, dashboards, charts, and graphs that you see here um, automatically update to only show me the, the failed transactions. So now the analysis we're seeing only relates to 28,000 items for a total value of 35 million euros um, in this data set. Um, you can see a um, histogram of the net um, value of purchase orders throughout the period. Um, and we can see that there is a spike here in our data set in October 2009 of uh, a high number of failed transactions. So um, since this is in my last quarter, if we were in 2009, um, we, we can again filter on that month because it's a particularly high spike. And now I'm, uh, with a couple of clicks, I've uh, filtered down on um, failed transactions in October. We're only looking at 2,000 or 1,900 items for 4 million um, euros. I can easily um, filter by value and narrow down on the second vendor, which has one PO item um, called All Round Services with one PO item for 1.25 million euros. So naturally, I would be um, concerned that this might be potentially fraudulent and suspicious transaction, or just generally from my business knowledge, I know that um, this um, vendor should not be performing um, like this. Um, so again, I can filter on that. Now, I mentioned earlier that all this analysis is very powerful, but we've taken it to the next step where um, from um, this analytical component, we can then um, create observations and communicate with the business um, directly. And we've leveraged here um, some of the latest technology that um, our process mining partners, Salonis, have made available. Um, and that is their machine learning component, which picks up all the data that we've filtered and analyzed here. And by clicking the Create Observation button here, we can then go into their workflow functionality called the Action Engine. Um, and here I've uh, created uh, previously some sample transactions um, or sample observations, I should say. Um, so here's one from a couple of days ago. Um, this is um, an observation that uh, was created um, by an auditor, and we can see the date and the time. The auditor created an observation related to a certain analytical test uh, for purchase to pay process. Um, the observation concerned um, has one case um, for 1.8 million euros, um, and this is all uh, automatically populated information. Now, from here, I can take a few steps, either um, export um, the data in a PDF format or go back to the analysis by simply clicking the button open in analysis in order to review um, the observation um, the internal auditor created. Or I could, um, for example, request further information from the business by pressing the button validate with business. Um, this creates a, an email template that pre-fills um, some of the data, um, and I can easily send it to, to my colleagues um, who can then provide further information of why that happened. Um, now, I should say that all of this um, is completely customizable depending on, on the objectives and the needs. So just bringing back the, um, the thought that what, what you're seeing is um, something that we've developed and exists 
but he, he's um, serving the purpose of demonstrating what's possible rather than um, prescribing what um, is um, best for, for all scenarios and for all companies. Um, I, can, I can easily assign um, these tasks to, to either myself or to a colleague using the, the tool. Um, and there is a very handy comments box here where you can just um, either communicate with the rest of your internal audit team if you're a reviewer and a, and a senior manager or where if the business has access to the tool, they could provide comments um, and there is a nice um, audit trail of all that is happening. Now, um, hopefully that gives you an idea of um, how powerful the tool is um, because by a few clicks only, we were able to narrow down on, on a particularly interesting case, create an observation, um, communicate that observation with the business and potentially receive feedback um, very quickly. So that linking back to our vision for next gen allows us to also work in a very agile manner. So um, by having all of this data at our fingertips, we can really respond quickly um, and then change the area of focus of, of our work because um, we have full visibility of, of what's happened. Um, circling back to the continuous monitoring element, um, this app could be sitting on top of um, your ERP data or actually multiple systems. And the data here that we've got uh, as a sample data, 70,000 items, could be running live through all these tests and could be automatically informing you either through the tool or by um, uh, something as simple as an email that, uh, in fact, today there was a transaction that circumvented the PO approval control for a particularly high value so you might want to um, look at that either as a risk function or as an internal audit function or even um, the first line monitoring their own controls using the tool on live data. This can be applied to all sorts of processes. Um, any process that has transactional data, it doesn't need to be a finance process. So in that sense, the tool is um, very versatile and um, and I suppose that's why we're, we're also excited because it can have the power to fundamentally change um, the way we work in, in the audit profession. I uh, feel that um, probably it's time for me to give you now a, a nice break from my voice. So uh, I will stop sharing and I'll pass over to Gary who, um, who has another question for you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is a multi-choice uh, question, so please uh, feel free to answer as many of these as possible. The question is that process mining features allow for, and as I say, you know, select those answers that work for you. Thank you. I'll just give you a, a few seconds to fill this one in. Thank you, everybody. Well, I, I think, Gary, this might be a first time where we have 100% of the respondents all answering the same way. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I think this means Stan did an excellent job in sort of walking through features and benefits of the process mining, the Sloan's process mining platform. Um, and, I, you know, our view is absolutely Give, depending on your objectives, it can be used for everything that's listed on the screen and, and probably more. Um, I think for those that have sort of audit and control responsibilities, certainly that data-driven process discovery, that kind of walk through and, um, and process flowing to some extent, capability, uh, all of the contemporary stuff that we're very used to around being interactive and dynamic in the analysis and visualizations and the ability to click through and all of that kind of good stuff exists. And then some of the, I think what I'd call probably enhanced features around being able to trigger, initiate workflow, drive process intervention, um, leverage automations, which we didn't dive into in a lot of detail, but there's even the ability to kind of initiate what I call commercial grade RPA through the process mining platform. 
and then leverage sort of machine learning capabilities for either routine scripting or, or really more advanced stuff that would help you predict outcomes, uh, identify root cause and so on and so forth, all, all very possible and features that, that we've used and we've seen uh, many of the other sort of Salonis clients or customers making use of. So it's fantastic to see that level of uh, unanimity, I think, if that's a word, in the response. And, and Gary, I think we have another question as well before we get into wrap up and Q and A. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, there is one more question. Um, what are your plans for data and analytics use for the forthcoming twelve months? I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to fill this in, and then we'll show the results. Okay, Andrew, over to you. Well, excellent. Um, well, once again, everyone's on the same the same page, which is great to see. And I will say um, for the attendees we have today, um, what, what you're what you're suggesting, what you're expecting, is better. It, it, presuming expected use is better, increased use is better, better than. Uh, what we've seen in some much broader recent surveys we've conducted and when we've had these webinars or these types of webinars for other audiences. So I think um, it's very encouraging to see that. Uh, I mean, we're you're kind of surrounded by data. Um, you look at any of the studies around the, the volume of data that's being you know, created on a daily basis, and it just is a very steep curve. Um, data really drives much of what we do in our personal lives, how we're influenced, uh, how we influence, and certainly in the, in the professional and business setting, those that have been able to sort of unlock the power of data and use it to drive competitive and business advantage, uh, you, you, see, you see them um, moving moving faster towards their goals uh, than than others who perhaps aren't making so, so much use. So I think very you know, equally important for us as audit controls, uh, practitioners and professionals to be seeking to do exactly the same. So very pleased to see that level of response. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of kind of bring this to uh, a bit of a conclusion and then we'll, we've had a couple of questions coming in via the Q&A. Uh, please, just as a reminder, do use the Q&A feature to submit any questions that you have. And um, after my sort of closing remarks, we will take a few minutes to, to try and address those. Um, so, I, and I and I kind of maybe gave a bit of a spoiler to this early on, but so sort of, you know, what are some of the, the things that we can be doing, um, and that I think we have seen clients and our clients of ours and others do in their pursuit of trying to increase their use of analytics and data, um, which every, every one of you I think has said you are. You're targeting to do so. I think there's some, you know, there's an element of just a mindset and an approach, um, and a renewed focus and commitment to to accomplish more data-driven approaches. I think that comes from a few angles. I think it comes top down. So I think that's a sort of a leadership uh, aspect where it's established as part of our strategy, as part of our plans for the year. Um, it's 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 set within our teams as as objectives and goals. Um, and even if it's a small kind of incremental improvement, it's something that we actually establish for ourselves and we drive towards. I think it can be influenced from outside of our direct teams, so by the broader organization, perhaps even by those outside of our organization, our, our counterparts in other, in other organizations, what are they doing, how are they making use of data, what tools are they using, et cetera, uh, but probably more, more directly by our business technology and data counterparts that we interact with. Uh, what capabilities do they have? How have they established their teams? Um, do they have a BI center of excellence? What's their toolkit? Can we take advantage of anything in their toolkit? Um, oftentimes where we've seen a process mining solution like Salonis licensed by the business, board and control folks are very eager to take advantage of that platform and use it for their own, their own purposes. Um, and then and I think there's kind of quote unquote bottoms up as well. So uh, our resources are on the ground doing the work, um, 
doing some of it kind of the traditional way, looking for opportunities, establishing in them sort of a an inquisitive and innovation type mindset to explore and find better ways of doing things and then really encouraging that and making, you know, training as much of which can be found and available freely um, online through most of the large sort of technology vendors. Uh, encouraging that and encouraging that level of kind of grassroots or, or bottoms up participation. So I think all of those are important. I think some fresh thinking around how and where in the light, in the light audit and controls life cycle analytics can be used. Stan kind of stepped through that earlier. So I think those that responded kind of ad hoc use earlier in the, in the uh, earlier polling question, you know, it's oftentimes it's things around um, selecting samples, maybe extrapolating issues that we found maybe doing some limited support of field work and testing, but but not much outside of that kind of, you know, that that pretty narrow component of a full life cycle, which starts with a oftentimes with an enterprise level risk assessment and drills down to a project risk assessment. You get into project planning and scoping, you get through discovery, right? All of those phases absolutely data can be used to influence and inform and, and allow us to, you know, maybe maybe do those more efficiently, effectively, et cetera. And then making use of, you know, the latest technologies and tools that are available. So um, I think that's something that hopefully we've just given you an example of today. Uh, again, it's not the solution. It's not the only thing that can allow you to move from where you are to where you perhaps like to be. But it's an example of when you apply these types of things together, um, uh, will will we'll perhaps you know help you get to. Um, the increased use that you've all said you'd like to try and accomplish. Um, so the, the, the app that we are going to move through this slide very quickly, but the app that we profiled is something that we've actually you know, published and made available. So to any of you, I think there are a number of you that responded. You're actually using Solonis. You can, um, you can visit their app store. You can see the app listed there with some additional information about it. Um, and you can you know, request to learn more. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, I would say, you know, one of the, one of the many things that sort of makes Solonis as a process mining vendor stand out from others in the space is that there is a very robust app store that has a lot of prepackaged content, and those, that, that content really represents a series of accelerators that allows you to get to the point of being able to uh, do kind of or make use of the analyses uh, much more rapidly. So, Gary, I think with that we'll move to... Q and A, um, and I'll just, I'll just, I think there are a number of things that have come through the the line. Uh, so appreciate all the interest, appreciate everyone's kind of time and participation so far. Um, so Gary, I don't know if you had any just sort of administrative or, or other comments to make before we get into Q and A. Just coming off mute. Sorry about that. I think uh, I think we're in a good place time-wise. We've probably got enough time for about uh, you know three or four questions, Andrew. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. So um, let's. There's a number here, and I'm just trying to read them quickly. Um, Maybe so um, I'll, I'll that, take. The... Go go ahead, please. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'll take uh, the first question while we, we get a chance to go through them. Um, we, we had a question come in, which I thought was a very good question, um, probably because of our data set. Um, you notice a high number of uh, controls that have high uh, fail rates. So the question was, how do you limit um, the number of false positives? Now, uh, again, I, I want to stress that the tool is incredibly flexible and um, and in our demo, we had designed our ideal controls um, and um, what we would expect from a, a well-controlled organization. However, all these tests um, can be tailored to accept either known variants or something that is uh, accepted by the organization. So they're not preset, and they can absolutely be tailored to, um, to the respective processes, ERPs, and um, even the risk upside of the organization. So, um, again, false positives um, might seem like an issue, but um, they, they can very easily be tackled um, by just um, amending and customizing um, the tests. Great. Thank you, Stan. So I'll, I'll cover a couple of other fairly quickish questions. There's a few that sort of theme together, which is, 
um, what systems can this be used to uh, analyze what data sets, any limitations, and there's a few questions that are generally aligned with that kind of theme. So the answer is any any data set, any transactional data set that meets the criteria I established earlier. So to make it take advantage of the process mining capabilities, I'll say that you know Solonus as a platform is uh, is basically a fully featured BI platform, so you can do non-process mining related analysis and BI work in the platform as well. But uh, any, any data set that has those transaction identifiers of kind of what was done, what was it done to, and when was it done, ideally who did it, um, that's user ID, case ID, activity ID, and timestamp in process mining kind of vernacular. Um, so that's SAP, Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics, Salesforce, Concur, Ariba. The, the, the list goes on, proprietary systems, systems that you know many of us maybe haven't, aren't familiar with or haven't heard of. As long as the transactional data set is there, the data can be, can be brought in and can be analyzed, and it's process agnostic as well. So while our example was specific to a system, the system and, and process, it can be applied to, to really anything. So hopefully that helps. Um, there's another question around uh, is the approach, this approach accepted by external auditors for reliance purposes? So I think I'll answer that generally speaking. Um, generally speaking, yes. Uh, Data-driven, analytics-driven, continuous monitoring approaches are acceptable to most external auditors. Facts and circumstances of the specific engagement client situation will determine the extent to which that's actually going to be possible. Uh, but they'll, ob they'll obviously and, and routinely have questions. What data are you looking at? How are you assuring the data is complete and accurate? It goes back to some of the, the, the comments Stan just made. Um, what, what business logic are you applying to it? So they're going to have the questions that, uh, that they'll want to ask and get comfort around to make sure that the outputs can be relied upon for their purposes. But, but generally speaking, yes, you should expect, not just for this, but for other data and, data and analytics-driven approaches, external auditors to be able to get themselves comfortable for reliance. Um, Stan, maybe you want to start with this next one, uh, which is what would be reasons, and I guess valid reasons, for organizations to not want to or not be ready to engage in a data-driven approach? Um, so uh, I think that that's a very interesting question because, um, frankly, uh, I don't think of that many or anyway valid reasons, but perhaps um, uh, not to engage or not want to engage, but perhaps um, uh, um, uh, the right question is um, what is the right time for, for companies to start engaging with that driven, a data-driven approach? Um, I would say that, uh, that the right time is now, even if there is a um, system migration or system implementation, you can actually use this approach to um, get a, a temperature check and, and see what your process is currently like, quickly identify what's not working well, what's not efficient, what's not well controlled, and keep that in mind and make it uh, a, per, uh, a requirement for the next um, version of the system or, or the different tool you're implementing to, to ensure that um, this operates correctly. Um, moreover, these data-driven approaches, and particularly the efficiency elements, are absolutely what um, the most competitive companies are doing at the moment. Um, but um, um, so, so I suppose um, the answer is that there aren't many valid reasons not, not to think about um, um, even taking small steps by um, taking uh, small processes or small data sets, um, visualizing them, um, and then proceeding further. Yes, Dan, maybe I'll, I'll kind of add a couple of comments. I mean, I think slightly different spin on the question. I mean, there are legitimate challenges for organizations in pursuing data-driven approaches. So I don't think we want to uh, understate the extent to which those exist. I mean, I've, I've been in this profession for a while um, <laughs> and over, over, over 20 years. And I think... The, Analytics, data mining, derivatives of those things have been a hot topic my entire career. Um, yet we haven't seen that the level of marked progress 
that we might expect if organizations had figured this out over that period of time it still remains something that people are trying to make better use of and when i say this i mean data and analytics broadly so there are there are clearly legitimate challenges i don't think we want to kind of under understate those um i think the the skill set i mentioned the technical skill set to make use of tools and technologies and apply them is is probably the most easily overcome in my opinion i think the mindset and getting everyone in the analytics frame of mind and and looking at sort of business problems through the lens of what data is available and how that data is being used by the business and how it can be used by others to kind of tell a story i think is probably a little bit more challenging in dealing with kind of you know people human nature um a reluctance resistance skepticism in some cases um and then i think the data set is a legitimate challenge for lots of organizations none of these tools for the silver bullet solution to data governance poor data quality those types of things those are absolutely those are necessary hurdles that need to be overcome uh we think and we've seen that the time and effort invested in solving those problems and getting to a point where you've got a a quality robust reliable accessible data set that can be used time and time and effort expended to get to that point well what well worth it for uh, what can be accomplished thereafter by by the business as a whole and by sort of individual groups within it so maybe a slightly different angle to that question and then um I'll just comment on something that just came in uh broadly speaking how do we suggest we kind of you know promote a tool like this within our department um where you know where some team members may be a bit resistant to change and i think i would broaden it to just new technologies in general right so um i think starting point find someone if it's a counterpart in another organization if it's a you know a professional firm like productivity but doesn't have to be that um that has knowledge and capability or go out on your own and and you know do some of your own learning and sort of get yourself up a couple of levels in the in the sort of the knowledge curve uh and then do a do a review session do a do a demo uh things like you know digital days things like innovation days or or lunch over lunch um i'm sure many of us are meeting each other virtually for coffee and lunch these days so making use of some of that time to just do a hey i found this interesting thing i'd like to do kind of a walk through and i'd say that you know um i get had a question of to sort of raise it but maybe averse or skeptical about stuff is not necessarily a bad thing it's it's a cha- it's a point of sort of challenge as long as that challenge is constructive and legitimate it really helps us think through uh, can this really be used for us for business benefit So you know those are the sorts of things that I think and then once you get interest there's lots of other things you can do beyond that to to drive awareness and adoption. Um I think Gary for your time for one more question. Um Stan, if there's one you like in the Q&A grab it but otherwise I guess there's a question here around uh for tools like this so sort of what's the process to get data into them? um yeah. and how straightforward or otherwise might that be Yeah then to add to that um there were a couple of questions around the length of implementation or a typical timeline um so we we would say that um um the a typical project that would very much depend on the process we're looking at and and the number of systems that we need to piece together um but for most the processes and that's not only finance processes but customer journey or or any other process um a four to six um week uh, timeline would be uh what um we've seen in our experience from data extraction to to the reporting phase but but that that includes the analysis of the data validation with the business etc <clears throat> Okay, thanks Dan. So I think Gary that's probably all the Q&A we have time for today. I appreciate everyone's interest. Um and we'll just hand back for a kind of closing remarks. Stay stay well everyone and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. everyone. There are there are a few more questions uh that we probably didn't get round to so rest assured that uh Dan and uh, Andrew can see those questions so I'll pass those over to them. 
Thank you, Andrew and Stan, for the Salonis demo as well. Uh, we have a lot more information. Um, uh, this will be in your um, follow-up email later today. So please look out for it. And if you do need any more uh, information on the internal audit, please feel free to sort of visit the Pativity website where you'll find uh, our internal audit section. Um, the, uh, the email uh, will be shareable later. So when you get it, please do uh, uh, share that on with your colleagues. But that includes the session for today. So all, I, all it remains for me to say is thank you for your attention and have a good afternoon. Thank you.